are your, you know, predictions for the global hospitality sector as a whole, like right now? So hotels, hostels, Airbnb, short-term accommodations, you know, everything's just massive. Travel's really grown, obviously. Yeah, well, you know, travel's grown, but it's it's not sorted. <laughs> you know, I still I still get quite quite sweats, cold sweats when I think about booking travel. I think it's it's still a pretty horrific experience, uh, not, not aided by us in any way, uh, because I think that travel, it still, it still offers too many choices uh, that I don't need, um, and it's still a pretty horrifying experience. You know how many how many forms do I have to fill in to make a booking? You know for two nights, three nights in the U.S. So it just it's just mind-boggling how many booking systems I've got to use if I'm going to book the hotel, the flight, the, the car or the, the, the car into town or whatever else. It's just, it's just horrific. I mean, I remember, you know, doing a, a thing that says, well, you know, if I, if, I, if, I, if I Google hotels in Dublin, I get something like 28 million pages in my responses. Now, there's only 300 hotels in Dublin. So the least you could do is only show me the 300, you know, and then, you know what, I've been staying in five stars a long time. Why are you showing me any more than the five that are five stars? And then, you know, I've stayed in one of these and said it was shit before. So I'm not going to stay in it. So why don't you just show me four hotels, you know? And so there's a lot, there's an awful long way to go in, in, in hotel, in, sorry, in, in, in booking technology in how we, look at how travel should be booked. There's a long way to go. Hey, everybody. Christine here, founder of Kindred, with another fun episode of the Co-Living Code show. I really hope everybody's staying safe and healthy wherever you are out there in the world. I promise you we're going to get through this. Also, big news from the Kindred team, our book, The Co-Living Code, for large operators and then also the version for investors. Both versions just came out this week, fresh off the press. We we have a digital version, so you can reach out to our team for that link. And we also have them listed on Amazon if you'd like the print version. So let's go ahead and jump into this week's episode. It's kind of a unique episode, actually, a little bit different than our normal. I finally got on Ray Nolan. He was the original founder of HostileWorld.com back in like the late 90s. So we definitely talked more about the technology side of shared living, hostel living. We definitely dove deep into co-living and his thoughts about co-living. Again, he knows travel and hostels and shared living very, very well. I will read his bio and then we'll get right into it. Ray Nolan founded HostelWorld.com, his third company in 1999. Hostel World still remains the go-to site for booking hostels across the globe, generating billions in booking value for hostels in 150 countries. Ray sold the business in 2009, generating over $500 million return for shareholders on just $150,000 invested. As a non-exec chairman of Skyscanner from 2010 to 2013, Ray was instrumental in that company's growth from a 60-person startup to a world leader in price comparison for flights. Skyscanner was sold for $1.6 billion. A keen sports fan, Ray also founded Ultimate Rugby, the world's most popular rugby app with Irish rugby international Brian O'Driscoll. So again, enjoy this week's episode. We dive deep into co-living, global travel, and of course, we definitely talked about the coronavirus and his thoughts on the impact of travel and shared living. Hello, everybody. Christine here with another fun episode of the Co-Living Code Show. Today, we have Ray Nolan. He is the founder of Hostel World back in 1999. So we're going to go back. And we're also going to talk about possible comparisons between hostels and now co-living, which is a nascent industry. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, good morning to you. Good afternoon from me. Yes, you're in Ireland right now. So yeah. Yeah. welcome, welcome. Um, so let's start with, you know, you had a very successful run. You know, obviously I know your background is in technology and marketing and you're a dot-com guy. Um, and you've never ran your own hostel. You've never stayed in a hostel, I've heard. <laughs> so I'd love to hear first how you realized back in 99, which is very impressive, that the hostel industry needed a major, major help on the technology side. 
Yeah, I think that when people look at hostels now, they're seeing a very different product to what was even available in 99. Um, most hostels back then were small, family run or, you know, sort of 40 bed, 50 bed environments, which were kind of invariably run by somebody wearing uh, sneakers or, or, or a thong or whatever it is. Um, depending on how you call them. Um, and, and so, yeah, they were, they were running their, their, their reservations books literally on spreadsheets or even on paper using a paper diary. And they would, you know, if you call and you said, I want to stay, you know, Monday to Friday, they would turn and write your name in against a bed on a line every, on every day. Uh, and that's how it worked. And there was no confirmation of bookings and there was, it was all very hairy, really, because you could arrive in, in Paris and every single hostel bed would be full and people would, would spend, typically spend the first night in Paris uh, on, on a park bench and then be queuing at 8 a.m. in the morning uh, for a hostel for that night, uh, which is pretty, pretty scary if, if it's your first time in Paris. And it's a pretty safe place. But, uh, and that was not atypical, really. There were, it was kind of a pretty comsy gozy kind of a way of running businesses. Uh, it wasn't terribly professional, uh, not in a bad way, just was very different. Uh, and, and that came with its good side too, because it was very, you know, familial, very friendly, people were there to help you and so on and so forth. And so did you start, I know you did both sides, very similar to what we're doing with Kindred. Did you start on the property management side, the back office stuff, or did you start with the directory um, for marketing? Yeah, so we originally, I mean, way before 99, I think like in 95, would have written a back office system for hostels. Yeah. And so it would allow you, it was a PC, a piece of software for a PC. It allowed you see all your beds that were for sale, see who's in each bed and, you know, do, do your totes on your, on your, on your, on your tail and do your bookings and see which rooms need to be cleaned and so on and so forth. And then in 99, we kind of morphed that and attached it to the internet, the great new internet at the time, and sort of uh, attached that, that booking system to, to, the, to the browser and allowed people to make bookings using credit cards. And I suppose, you know, that was a pretty radical change. I mean, you know, even the early hostels to adopt the web were building their own sites. So it'd be, you know, abchostel.com would be my hostel and I'd, I'd market it. And then if you wanted to make a booking, it would say, you know, you'd, you'd email them. You'd say, hey, can I stay on so from the 17th to the 19th? And they typically would read their email every other day, you know, uh, and then they would write back to you and you'd say, they'd say, yeah, you can have it on the 17th, it's fine. And then and you'd mail, you check your mail every other day. And so it's now four days later and you go and say, great, I'll take it. And then you write back and they go, no, that's gone. So there was a whole problem there. So you couldn't make a confirmed booking online. And the problem also was that everybody would write to five hostels or 10 hostels in a city. So you write to, you go to Dublin, you say, oh, I'm going to check all the hostels for availability between the 17th and the 19th. And so each hostel is putting a dollar's worth of effort into what could be a $10 booking. So suddenly, nobody's making money. And so we came in and we automated the connection so you could see live availability from our back office system now connected to the web. So you could make a booking and nobody had to touch it. Nobody had to say it was available, not available because it was, it was always there. In what countries did you start in? So we had our back office product in Ireland and in the UK and uh, then we put it, then, then when Hostel World officially started in 99, we, we went Ireland, UK, Israel of all places. Cause I have, I've had always had more than one business and I was there for something else. Uh, and then the U S uh, Netherlands, France, and then everywhere. Nice. And Hostel World is such a great domain. So was that available when you got in 99 or did you have to pay for it? Oh yeah, we paid, we paid 70 bucks. Okay, <laughs> $70. Yeah. So we had, and, and not only do we have Hostel World, I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, you know, back in the day, SEO and online marketing was kind of nascent. And so we had hostelworld.com, hosteleurope.com, hostel every country in the world.com, hostel most of the cities in the world.com. So we had, if you were a French hostel in Paris, you were on hostelworld.com. You were on hosteleurope.com, you were on hostelfrance.com, and you were on hostelparis.com. Each were similar looking sites, but not identical. 
So the power, hostel power site obviously only had the Parisian hostels, but the idea being obviously for, for back in the day, Google and Yahoo, the search uh, optimization was pretty hot. So uh, yeah, it worked pretty well. Nice. See, that's why you're called the dot-com guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we went on to buy hostels.com, which was not cheap. We paid uh, four million or three point seven five million dollars for that one domain name once. What year was that? I think it was oh three. Yeah, oh three, four years. Nice. Ago. Oh, that's a great. That's a great name. <laughs> you yeah. can do better than that, right? And then it yeah. just redirects, so it's still connected. Oh, I don't think. I, well, we never wanted to redirect when I had the company, and we should, you know, preface maybe this conversation is that I founded it, but sold it in 2009 yeah, so yeah. uh and really thereafter it kind of performed differently to the way i would have i would have done it but that's that's okay no definitely we read your bio in the beginning and uh yeah we definitely said you had it for those 10 years um yeah. probably crazy fast-paced growth i know <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean at, at one stage funny enough as i look at the stock price today just for interest sake at one stage we it was worth about one point three billion dollars. Now it's worth uh, about forty, fifty. Ooh. So it's a very different company now. I mean, not a different company. It's just it. it I think it lacked. It, it, we were very entrepreneurial, and we, we did some kind of cool things. And the the business model for those who've not stayed in the hostel, the hostel world business model became the model for hostels, which was you paid a deposit when you made your booking. And then you pay the rest of the hostel at the time when you arrived, which, which, was, which was great because we never owed the hostel any money. And it meant the hostel got paid when it should get paid. So there was no sort of big, long chasing credit. And, you know, the price of a bed for a hostel being, you know, even 25 bucks, uh, you did not want to spend two or three dollars in admin fee chasing payment from hostel booking companies. You just you got your money from the punter who was straight in front of you, you know. And I know so you had the... Uh... the yeah, the million dollar checkbox, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I suppose, that, and, and again, back in the day, we were always about 10% deposit, which I think they should have stuck to, but they, they decided when you've no ideas, all you have is price to play with. And they went for bigger deposits and so on, which I personally wouldn't have gone for. I think you could be more creative. But one of the things that we did was knowing that, so Hostel World didn't set its price. It just said, I get 10% of the booking. And so how do you make more money in a world where you only get 10% of the price? Because the hostels create control their own price, which is unlike merchant product like hotels in terms of hotels like Conrad, Speedy or Bookings or whatever, where they buy the hotel room for a hundred bucks and they charge whatever they want for it. Uh, in hostel world, if the, if the bed price was 25 bucks, we got 250. That was just it. Um, and so we had to be creative in terms of ways that we might make more money. Uh, and one of the ways was this million dollar checkbox, which basically, uh, the, the deal was when you made a booking was that it was, it was a, a non-refundable deposit, non-refundable deposit. So if you say, I'm going to go to Berlin for three days uh, and, you know, a week beforehand, you say you're not going, you just forfeit the deposit. No big deal. You lose, you might lose typically $10, $12 would be what you lose. People were happy with that. But I felt that some people would probably like to reuse that deposit. So what we did was we enabled them to ensure their, their booking. Uh, using what we called cancellation protection back in the day, it's probably still called that. It took me a long time to think of that term, but it really it has become the kind of norm in terms of the market norm for this kind of model. And basically, you got to pay a dollar or two to insure your deposit. And so, if you needed to, you could say, "I'm canceling," but you get to reuse the deposit you, that you had there, and you get to reuse it on another booking. And so, that was wonderful because it generated an extra dollar or two on every booking, but also. People rarely claimed on that on that uh, reuse of the deposit. They typically ticked the box because it felt like a good thing, but didn't realize, you know, didn't come to reuse the deposit. So it, it generated like a million bucks in year one. It's a nice, it's nice cheap uh, piece of technology. It took it took about two days to write the code, and it generated a million bucks in the first year. Love that. No, I love that story. And so like jumping over to co-living, do you see any crossover happening? You know, what are your thoughts about co-living as an industry that's popping up? Yeah, I have to say in, in a world where 
particularly in Ireland, it's the same as, you know, we, we, you've got expensive rentals, and I'm sure downtown, I, I see San Fran and things like that, and cities all over the US and, and all over Europe where, where rent is expensive. Co-living seems like, like the natural progression. There's an awful lot of dead space. This is the same as, you know, should I own my own car? Should I own the room I use once, a, once you know, every now and again? Uh, I probably shouldn't. I should probably rent that room or part own that room. So a co-living world where I've got my own space in my own bedroom or whatever and then the shared lounge shared kitchen facilities not so different to hostels really but um for sure the the idea that there's co-living and I, I guess there's rules of combat in terms of you know keeping places clean and so on they always became that was kind of the norm in hostels yeah certainly when when we got into the business it was the norm in hostels that people it was an etiquette att attached to staying in a hostel which i'm sure sort of pervades the, the co-living world that, you know, you couldn't be the, the person who always leaves the, the stuff in the dishes, who has a party in the, in the co-living area and the shared area uh, all the time just leaves a mess. So that's probably not the thing so much anymore. Um, I think hostels, again, hostels migrated, I guess, with us when we kind of brought the tech into it, it made it easier for the professionals, if you like, to move in. And so it was less about mom and pop running hostels and more about big tech or big, big property companies, fr frankly, running three and 400 bed hostels. And they then kind of got to a world where they said, you know, this shared kitchen stuff, not so sure. And they started to say, well, you know, we, we provide breakfast and it costs this. And there's a, you know, they're bigger, they could afford to put a, put a kitchen in and, and, but they would charge you for coffees and whatever. You didn't, you didn't make your own in the back kitchen anymore. So it's still a mix of that, isn't it? I'm not sure if that's everywhere, but certainly the, the trend was for bigger hostels and then groups of hostels, people who own companies who owned a hostel in six cities. So they could pass you from the Paris hostel and say, why don't you stay in our London hostel? Why don't you stay in our, you know? And so that was the way it went. But a lot of, lot of parallels, really. Um, I mean, and, and I think the beauty of co-living and hostels, I mean, you know, although I've never stayed in one, this, the, the, that really just because I'm too bloody old. Well, not necessarily, but it tends to have been a young person's thing. But the reality is why hostels work uh, is that you get to meet other travelers and you get to get their advice on what's working locally and where's the good bar and what's the good thing to do while I'm here and what street should I avoid and what street should I go to? And so that is, you know, that's still the essence of being in a hostel. And quite frankly, you know, in the budget hotel world, you can still... You can probably book two or three people into a, into a cheap hotel for cheaper than you'll stay in a hostel, but you won't get the hostel experience. You'd be sitting beside old footy duddies like me with briefcases and laptops when all you want to do is party. And so you want the advice that you're going to get from people in the area. And, and to bring that to co-living, I guess it's a little bit similar. You're gonna, you've got a community in your, in your, in your space uh, that can help you with stuff. And you can share, obviously, things like Wi-Fi bills and Whatever yeah, else. definitely. No, no, no. That's perfect. Those are perfect parallels. And then, so talking about, you know, I know you guys had some big, big partnerships. And again, this is helpful for even operators in the co-living industry. I don't know who your biggest partnerships were, like Lonely Planet. I don't know. Maybe you can name a few. Like which partnerships, big partnerships did you guys create and how did you do that? So the big ones would probably have been airlines, funny enough, uh, the Ryanairs and Easy Jets and so on of this world, but also Lonely Planet, Let's Go, Guy de Routard, every travel book that you could name, uh, we were partnered with and we were the booking engine, if you like, on their website. You may not have known that when you're booking because it was white labeled, so it looks like Lonely Planet, it sounds like Lonely Planet, but it's not Lonely Planet, it's us. Um, and those were kind of symbiotic relationships you know the, the reality is the 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 publisher like lonely planet would take a piece of the booking and they would share it uh with us i mean we would take the money and we'd share it back with them so they they would take anything up to well back in the day 30 40 percent of what we made on every booking i think now i think it's different i think it's probably more i don't know what the stats are um and sometimes like so so even that though you know in terms of that model that that partner share model very hard to go to an airline and say you know would you like to earn you know 20 percent of our of our or, or 30 percent of our booking fee of our booking deposit which would be you know say three four bucks per booking that's what they'd make they go well i sell airline tickets and they're 400 dollars or 300 dollars a go and we'd say yeah you know but 
the fact is people don't know they can go to uh, Amsterdam for the weekend and stay, like fly and stay for 200 bucks, you know? And so if you show them that, that there's an accommodation option that's priced the right level, then maybe they'll book the flight. So they, they care less about the, the revenue share, more about the fact they're selling more flights because people are inspired by travel uh, to, you know, inspired to travel where they wouldn't have thought they could get to. Oh, got it, got it. And that was just personal relationships. So you would reach out directly, like yeah, business development. Yeah, we did, we did uh, routinely 60 countries a year. Oof. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And then what, so talking about the importance of online reviews. So I know you guys have online reviews, you know, on each place. And I know it's even broken down, you know, value, cleanliness into different mm -hmm. categories. How important was that to implement onto the platform? I think it was probably the, the bit, well, one of the big things, I think the model, the business model itself, I mean, the software, yeah, you know, you, you get there with the software, but the, but the, but reviews were a big thing for us because with, with hostels, you don't, there is no star rating system. So there's no like five star hostel, four star, three star, two star, like you would have with hotels. And so we needed a way where people could differentiate hostels one from the other. And I remember thinking, you know, we can't be the arbiter of what's good and bad. We can't be the rating agency and still be selling them. So we're not the people who like the hotels. So we said like, really, it's gotta be the people who stayed in it. So I created the, the review system. Um, I remember, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but you still see it on the website, which is, you know, I said, okay, we'll do, we'll do it on, you know, five things. So let's agree five parameters. And I said, okay, so location has got to be one, security, cleanliness, staff, and say character, you know. Uh, and so they rate from, so when you stay in a hostel, two days after you leave, you'll get a mail saying, depending for your thoughts on your stay in ABC hostel. And so that was fine. So these were working titles for these these things and, and I uh, I never changed them. I got the code written, never, never checked what the good titles would be for the five reasons to rate the hostel. Never, never didn't go to Bain or anything like that. Just like literally caught them up and then published. And then suddenly there were 20 million reviews, but in reality, character, I mean, what's, what is character? So, so there's that whole thing that people just give a star to, they don't know what it's about to go. Oh, that's great character. It's great. You know, I was just thinking five words, five characteristics, but probably would not have put character on that list uh, had I thought about it for more than the time it take me to think of the idea. And don't forget, we were pre, yeah. and I've met Steve, uh, TripAdvisor Steve. I think we were like a few weeks pre the first TripAdvisor uh, review with our view system. So that was, yeah, that was my next question. Cause booking.com, Airbnb, you know, exp they're all doing that now, but I know you were doing it so early. It. Yeah. Nobody had them. And the beauty of ours was, so I took it from watching, I, I, I funny enough, I'm now in this sort of still in the software business, but now doing a lot of Amazon e-commerce kind of stuff. I actually took it from Amazon, took it from Amazon, eBay reference, like mm -hmm. relative rating systems and said, you know, this is a good thing. If I'm an eBay seller and I'm rated highly, people will stay with me. So I just said, okay, you know, and then we further, we took that further with, with hostel world, because what we did was we'd say, you know, you know, where Amazon says people who read this also like this. Well, we also said, well, you know, Americans who stayed in Berlin typically went to Dusseldorf next. So we'd use that as a, as a trigger to get you to book your next, to book your onward journey with us. Um, so we'd use a lot of parameters and data to, to try to predict where you're going. Wow. So you'd literally track, yeah, you would know based on where they're traveling from, and then you would only show based on that. Well, we'd recommend like logically, you know, if you're here, you're probably going to go here next. And certain nationalities wouldn't take that turn left or turn right, but they would go, they'd say, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, on the route around Europe that be, that's well trodden or I'm going to stay longer or whatever. So, yeah. That's nice. That's super cool. And then, so what are your, you know, predictions for the global hospitality sector as a whole, like right now? So hotels, hostels, Airbnb, short term accommodations, you know, everything's just massive. Travel's really grown, obviously. Yeah, well, you know, travel's grown, but it's it's not sorted. <laughs> you know, I still I still get white white sweats, cold sweats when I think about booking travel. I think it's it's still a pretty horrific experience, uh, not, not aided by us in any way, uh, because I think that travel, it's still it still offers too many choices uh, that I don't need. 
um, and it's still a pretty horrifying experience. You know, how many, how many forms do I have to fill in to make a booking, you know, for two nights, three nights in the US? So it just, it's just mind boggling how many booking systems I've got to use if I'm going to book the hotel, the flight, the, the car or the, the, the car into town or whatever else. It's just, it's just horrific. I mean, I remember, you know, doing a, a thing that says, well, you know, if I, if, I, if, I, if I Google hotels in Dublin, I get something like 28 million pages in my responses. Now there's only 300 hotels in Dublin. So the least you could do is only show me the 300, you know, and then, you know what, I've been staying in five stars a long time. Why are you showing me any more than the five that are five stars? And then, you know, I've stayed in one of these and said it was shit before. So I'm not going to stay in it. So why don't you just show me four hotels, you know? And so there's a lot, there's an awful long way to go in, in, in hotel, in, sorry, in, in, in booking technology in how we, look at how travel should be booked there's a long way to go but that's that's a bit of a sideline it's not a complete answer to your question no. where do i think travel is i think i think travel obviously you know we'll probably end up on the on the c word in a minute but but i think it's growing i think that uh i think there's a homogenization a little bit of of everything between budget hotel and hostel they're all you know when when the pros if you like came into hostels they 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 make everything very efficient and they're therefore less friendly. So you're not going to get the guy in the sandals on the shorts with the dreadlocks running the hostel anymore. And so it loses a little bit. So, so they all kind of look a little bit like budget hotels or, you know, they're trying to get that experience side of things. Um, I think people are getting smart too. I mean, why would you spend a lot of money on your hotel? Because realistically you're in your hotel bed for, you know, eight hours, you're asleep for seven or well, many of them as you like, but you know, people are going to start spending money on experiences and sort of to bring down their, their accommodations spend. And so probably the budget end, as long as it's seen as clean and, and, uh, and efficient, you probably see the budget sector grow. I think the middle sector will have problems. And then obviously the, the high end guys will, when I mean, you charge the kind of fees they charge uh, to stay in a five star, you can well afford to stay in that business. And there's people like fools like me, maybe who, who, who want to stay there. No, and, and to your earlier points, you're exactly right. You know, typically I use Expedia. I've been using it for years and you're right. It's like, I'm filling out the passport number each time and the whole form. And I'm like, why, why don't they just save it? My passport number is not going to change. Yeah. Um, you're right. It, it's not even that. It's just, it's, it's just the choice that I'm offered, you know, you know, and this is a bit like, you know, where I would have gotten, maybe, maybe we'll do travel again because I've got a, got a bit of a window of time. But, you know, why am I being offered options I'm definitely not taking? Why don't you just make it simple for me? There, there are only four hotels. And because I'm a friend of yours and you live in San Diego, you could, uh, I could then say, well, you say it's a crap hotel, so take that one off my list. So only show the ones, you know, so it, it, I'm not saying that the TripAdvisor wide uh, reviews, because I don't care if it's 500 reviews, if they're not me, it doesn't matter. But if I trust you, if I trust my really close friends, not my Facebook friends, which could be thousands, but actually the five or 10 people in my network, and we've never met before, so I'm using this as an example, but if those people whose views on hotels I respect, in other words, we're both road warriors. We both stay in hotels all the time. We both don't like, you know, showers where you've got to step into a bath and shower yourself down. That's enough for me. That's if, if Patty or a friend of mine says that's no good, that that, that hotel has that, I'm out. So now I want to take this big choice down to a small choice because I don't want to spend my day. I just want to like ping ping and I'm done, you know, so no, I no, sound no. like a curmudgeon, but there is a better way. <laughs> no. And, and so is there, is it Amazon? Cause you, like you said, they, they show you these recommendations that are pretty spot on in my opinion. <laughs> is there an e-commerce site or any site that you think is kind of mastering that? Um, I don't think there's anything with the complexity of travel that's done well yet. And the thing is, there's so many easy ways to make a book out of travel. And there's so many people in the food chain when you make a booking on, on, a, on a travel site. Uh, and it's so refined in terms of a science, in terms of how much money you got to pump into, into pay-per-click marketing or whatever. And you've got your lifetime values and all, you've got all this kind of stuff. And so it would take someone with a big, big lump of cash to disintermediate all the others and just say, I'm going to be the guy. 
Ray, you got to come back in. Get yeah, this organ. Yeah, get this organ. I find travel booking so frustrating that uh, I knew you would just for me, <laughs> like just, just build a travel business just for me. Yeah. Those are the best businesses. It's the entrepreneurs that they usually solve their own pain, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, That's a lot, awesome. lot to be done on it anyway. For sure. And so what are your thoughts on remote work? That's another, you know, of concept, um, you know, more, more than actually, let's say this first, you know, it's too big of a topic not to talk about. We have to, it's March 18th right now you know, how do you see the coronavirus impacting travel, hospitality, and, you know, remote work? Obviously, it's, it's making that grow quicker, um, you know, for the months to come. Yeah, well, I mean, just, I mean, there's certainly in six months time, and I'm no, no scientist, so I'm not claiming to know anything, but hopefully in six months time when this is still alive, but, but hopefully we're somewhat heading back to normal, we won't be anything like back to normal, the, we will learn an awful lot in the next six months about what remote work is. I mean, you've got, I've got an office with a couple hundred people. They're all gone home. You've got Google in Dublin with 6,000 people gone home. You've got many, many companies all working from home. So they're all experiencing work from home for the first time. And you know what? Then you go, how would you be in commercial real estate in a world where everybody realizes I get as much done when I'm at home, why do I need an office? So now I'm gonna get my next office, gonna be a third the size of my current office. So we have a couple of meeting rooms where we can hang out. Maybe it'll just be ten table tennis tables and, and a coffee dock, but it'll be our table tennis table and our coffee dock. And we'll go and meet there and we'll come and go. And there'll be very few people who will actually say, I need to be there because I just need the, I just need the rigidity of being in an office, but I actually wanna work from home. The rest of them will wanna work from home. So that's the first thing. We're going to learn an awful, awful lot in the next uh, six months. Uh, I think remote work is pretty cool. I mean, I think things like, you know, we're, we're on, um, what are we on, Zoom? Mm -hmm. it just makes it different, you know. All the other ones that were out there were so bad. Now it's like, it doesn't take an age to set up a meeting. We're not fiddling with microphones and doing all that stuff. Things like OWL, I don't know if you have Meeting OWL, which is pretty cool. That's a, a thing you sit on a desk and you can do very, very good uh, six people on one end, like in a boardroom maybe, and two people in another location, really, really good camera hardware. Um, so remote work all day, you know, realistically, what are we doing spending two, three hours in our cars, polluting the universe uh, to get to our jobs, uh, feeling stressed when we get there and stressed when we come home, and we could do it all from, from I, I can see it being like six months time, just revolutionary. I would not hold commercial real estate stock for all the tea in China. Uh, right now there you go i'm sure it costs a crash no one cares about my opinion anyway so there you go no 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 i think yeah. that no you're pretty spot on it's yeah there's going to be some math and i'm so glad zoom is working right now because it wasn't they actually gave it to schools for free so just to kind of get everybody by everybody's on remote work they're using it more their stock yeah. went off you know off the charts yeah uh, but then it got really yesterday was really buggy so i'm really glad it's working right now yeah, yeah, um nice. so i see that for sure and so what i would love to hear like what are you currently working on so i've just uh left my 10th business which which is called excelco which is which is uh basically um enabling software for e-commerce so if you buy and sell on amazon ebay walmart whatever you tend to get a lot of customer queries, which are like usually where's my where's my jumper, where's my dress, where's my runners, where's my sneakers, whatever. And we collect all that, all those queries, put them into one beautiful interface, put a bit of AI on the top of it and kind of help the agent automate the answer, not in a chat way, but in a really deep kind of connected way to your order that says, I'm so sorry, it will arrive tomorrow. And you know, uh, we know a lot about the order and where you are, and we know about the shipping data and so on. So it's a pretty cool company. And um, actually, I've been, I was there for three years. I just, I just resigned to six weeks ago. So I'm going to do something else. And I promised myself that I, I wouldn't think about what that might be, but I have a couple of ideas. I, I think the travel thing needs to be done, but I, I'm not sure if I've got the energy that it takes to build something bigger than booking.com. Uh, which is what this would need to be. Yeah. And so you know, my last question is like, what, because you don't have to work anymore. Like we know that no, no. you're set, you're set for life. Like what drives you? Uh, I think solving problems. I think, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a self-taught. I've never, ever had a job ever. Didn't get a, a qualification, all that kind of rubbish. But, but 
the reality is technology was put on this earth to solve problems and take make tedium go away and somewhere in the middle of it it actually created some tedium but it, you know it, we can it can be for good so if you can solve a problem and take something down from being an hour long to being five minutes long that's a good thing and so it it is i mean it, it it's 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 kind of an art it's the only art i know so i think it's very creative so you can you can be really off the planet in terms of the way you try to solve a problem you know i've been either lucky or or good or did a both and done it a few times and yeah keep at this good stuff well that's a perfect way to end this interview again ray thank you so much for taking the time i'm sure everybody listening and watching like learned a ton i know i did it's been, it's been great to have you christine you stay well and uh, hopefully we'll come out the far side of coronavirus and be back on airplanes or whatever it is Boats definitely, definitely. okay bye-bye bye-bye Thank you so much for checking out today's episode. If you want to learn more about co-living, you could check out my book on Amazon, The Co-Living Code. And of course, if you're looking for the perfect software to power your co-living concept, check out kindred.io, K-N-D-R-D.io. Thanks. And a quick thank you to SPX Agency for all of the graphics, animation, and design on our YouTube channel.